Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today I'm joined with an award-winning American cinematographer. You will definitely recognize his work. If you're a fan of Robert Eggers, you certainly know who this guest is. Today I'm joined with Jaron Blaschke. Jaron, thank you for coming on the show today. My pleasure. I'm glad we could, like, I could finally figure out a time. Thank you. Honor. So, as a starting point, obviously, when I first saw the first uh, film that was your work that I ever saw was The Lighthouse in theaters in um, in Tampa, Florida, actually. And I, I, I will say I love like, you know, black and white tie aspect ratio movies. So when I first saw the trailer for it, I thought, oh, brilliant. This is exactly what type of film I was looking for. I, I hadn't seen one since about Great Expectations, 1946. So I'm just curious, what got you interested in uh, in cinematography? That's a very, sorry, I had road noise over here. Um, that's a very specific demographic. Um, <laughs> um, black, white movies, 1946. Uh, I mean, I was always into make-believe and movies. And, uh, you know, as a kid, um, I never really took to sports. I just kept being a nerd. And I mean, when I was little, I was just playing with Star Wars figures in the, in the dirt, basically. Um, and uh just wanted to keep it going you know and then um, i got really into photography um uh, probably around you know 11 years old or so and then um and and certainly into high school and i i had a I lived in a small town but there's a local community college with a um the photography class so i would you know ride my bike up this butte in central oregon and uh go do that on mondays and wednesdays and then you know so yeah, then I decided, well, or I, I was kind of faced with, well, do I try to be a photographer? Or do I try to be a, you know, a, a director, which is the only job you know of really uh, in filmmaking in high school. Um, but I, yeah, for whatever, whatever reason, the whim led me to filmmaking. And then, um, yeah, and then I, I learned that I could, you know, I, I figured that there must be a job that's resp you know, responsible for the, I mean, you have to photograph a movie, so there must be some job that, you know, picks the shots, basically, uh, which is all you can sort of conceive of cinematography. So I um, went into that pretty much pretty much straight away. Um, and then you get into lighting, and that's a whole other thing you don't even think about, um, which, you know, in many films is all you're charged with as far as, this, you know, when you're a cinematographer. But, yeah, and I kind of just went from there. And then, you know, when I learned that... Uh, you know, to to do a thesis film with a director uh, in in film school, you know, it's, it's quite expensive, and uh, that further solidified <laughs> my cinematography choice, where someone else can pay for it, and then I'll just do you know most of what I want over here. Yeah, perfect. I mean, certainly that is a, certainly a big deterrent I hear from many people is the price. So that certainly isn't very surprising. But was there? Obviously, you said that, you know, you as a kid, you enjoyed Star Wars and everything like that. And you initially wanted to go into photography. Is there any film in specific that really inspired you? Maybe when you were a kid, you watched that film and thought, oh, how did they do this? You know, or anything like that? Um, I mean, I don't. There's just movies I remember visually and I probably didn't even know what why I felt a certain way when watching them. You know, I, I saw snippets of films probably I shouldn't have seen. You know, like uh, when I was eight to ten years old, uh, like Blade Runner, and I remember, like, I remember just the feeling from watching that. You know, as a child, and I would just see some scenes, and of course, it was the theatrical cut, and you know, on uh, on TV in the '80s, and uh, I'm sure it, I'm sure it looked, you know, to my current eyes, quite terrible, you know, for Blade Runner. But at the time, I remember having that that mood, and you know, I mean, other movies where I remember like distinctly feeling the the atmosphere that you could later attribute to the cinematography yeah it's probably it's it's pop culture stuff you know i mean i saw a snippet of aliens too you know i remember that having a kind of an impact uh and uh but something i'd watch more regularly would be like you know empire strikes back or something yeah. you know and, and just like those the lighting and that still stuck with me i didn't really attribute it to lighting i just knew that it had a a feel that i could I could just jive through, you know, the imagery. Um, yeah, and then I, you know, probably the later, you know, the probably the first film that I really noticed the cinematography just because it's so obvious is when you start watching, um, you know, 
Robert Richardson films uh, in high school, you know, like Natural Born Killers or other such, you know, nuanced films. So, um, yeah, later on, it's like, oh, well, that's cinematography is because it's just, you know, it's smashing in the face. So that that was actually somebody I really was into for a for a few years when you first get into it, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Robert, uh, the Natural Born Killers, I actually do really like. And I one thing that I love about cinematography is you can get such a diverse range. And I'm sure I'm sure, you know, you know, like for me personally, I wouldn't say cinematography was like the thing that. I fell in love with in regards to filmmaking. Mine was actually like writing stories, I guess. But like sure. I loved personally um, Milos Forman's Amadeus from the 1980s, right. like that I think is shot beautifully. Same with Barry Lyndon, sort of these old period pieces or maybe something like Laurence Olivier's Richard III. I really like the pastel color scheme of that picture. I feel like if I was to go back to 1400s England, I'd probably imagine it would be like Laurence Olivier's pastel color scheme or maybe that's just a dream of mine but yeah so I, I read online that you went to you moved to New York you mentioned that you grew up in uh, in Oregon you were born in California you yes. went to New York to go to the School of Visual Arts yes. now it what was your experience going to an art school I mean I can't compare it to like a you know a film school that you normally think of you know like NYU or something or um USC, but um, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s and in, you know, I left high school in 1994. I'm like, well, where, what are, where do I go to learn this stuff? You know, and so all you can do is go to the counselor's office in your public high school and they just put this, just drop this tome in front of you and you, you turn the pages and, you know, like there's not really filmmaking in there. It just says media. So I'm like, all right. So, you know, and there's like three colleges. Uh, I didn't even think NYU was in there. Or maybe I didn't know how to look this stuff up, you know. Um, but you know, SBA was in there and there was like Brooklyn college and something else, uh, you know, something like deep in the boroughs. Um, but you know, of these like three options in it, I was just poor at research maybe, but, but, it, you know, ultimately, um, when I got there and I got in on kind of a movie I made in high school with, uh, my best friend, actually, uh, there was also black and white shot on, uh, super VHS, but, it, uh, we, uh, and actually he had some, he had some, eight millimeter video in there is, yeah, it was um, not the highest photographic quality uh, technically. But um, anyway, got into SVA um, and it was actually a very practical school, you know? So, I mean, the, the very first day of class, there's like a Bolex in my hand and they're teaching me how to load it, you know, which is kind of exactly what I want. There was no, um, I mean, I had, I had actually a very good uh, film history class uh, for, the first two years as well you know we were watching 16 millimeter prints um because yeah the teacher had a, a, a print collection in 16 like everything from you know Maez to uh singing in the rain he had a technicolor 16 millimeter print of that to alice, alice doesn't live here anymore he, you know it was, it was incredible um so yeah but but really it was craft focused you know with a few um extracurriculars um i would i did have to read beowulf at some point but really was a lot of craft in there um which is tremendous uh after two years it was sort of like all right i'm ready to you know get out there so um but you know family made me stay in there and i did but um yeah no no real no real complaints after, you know at least at least for the first first two years and you mentioned that it was quite a practical course as you said they were teaching you how to load how to load equipment on your first day is that something that you were really keen on doing something extremely practical not something completely theory based where let's say you actually learn how to use the equipment instead of i don't know writing a twenty thousand word thesis on how others use the equipment is that what you were looking for maybe that could have filled me out more you know maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing um you know i did have a film history i did have a film theory class uh i think i was probably best at the you know just the hands-on you know yeah. the lighting how to you know framing uh just inherently as opposed to the abstract you know um intangibles so um and even you know, I, I might even carry that to this day you know I, i'm probably at least you know uh, I work on a Rob movie, you know, he's, he's definitely, I mean, far, by leagues, the most um, studied, you know, uh, of the two of us, and then he'll give me a, a watch list and I'll watch it. But, 
you know, I, I hope that the naivete uh, adds something, you know, I like to think that hopefully it brings a freshness or, or something, you know, but um, yeah, I didn't, I don't know, in, in the end, that's kind of shaped who I, or had some small part in shaping probably how I approach things, you know, you know, it's yeah, been done yeah. before, I like to think for a second that it's fresh, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I really like what you just said about how perhaps not being entirely knowledgeable on the subject or the genre gives a fresh perspective. I always like that when yep. I say you see a, a new director come in to a, maybe a well-known series and then they give a fresh perspective on it because you don't, I, personally me, right, when I'm watching a, a film or what have you in the cinema or something, I don't want to just, you know, see the same thing over and over and over again. I want that uniqueness. That's what I love about uh, Rob's and your, and your work so much is that it is so unique. You can't get anyone else who makes a movie like you or Rob or when you're working together. And in regards to your project, your work in the film industry, one thing that I like to ask my guests, um, you know, is do you remember the first film? Do you remember that first gig that you got, your first film that they asked you to be the cinematographer in? I mean, my first step, I was I was a camera assistant um, for a, a very close friend of mine uh, who was a year ahead of me in school. Um, and I definitely had some experiences there. I was just relaying one of them um, yesterday uh, about, you know, doing a, a music video in the South Bronx and being being shot at. Um, but uh, all kinds of, you'll, yeah, New York gives you some interesting experiences for sure. Um, but yeah, but the first, what's the first thing I shot? I mean, I, I directed a, a the, la, the first and last film I ever directed was a short film. It, it was actually black and white, um, my, my sophomore year, second year of uh, film school. Um, and it, yeah, it had kind of a, a spare sound design and, and was just trying to figure it out. Um, kind of existing in past and present at the same time. Um, and then what I shoot for someone else. I mean, eventually, I, I think I did a Yeah, I did a film like over the summer in Houston, Texas, which okay. August in Houston is you're, that's uh, just out there in the swamp. Basically, uh, it's quite strenuous. Uh, I got to ride a bus from New York to Texas, which takes some days and then work in the heat. Um, that was yeah, that was uh, interesting. I mean, you know, and then I did I did a kind of I got to do some larger short films before I did some features, actually. Um, but that kind of went more into after I got out of film school and I was actually um, shooting a lot of uh, Columbia Columbia films, you know, uh, because they don't have a cinematography department. So that's sort of my second film school, you know. Oh, perfect. You know, and I but, imagine that was quite practical too, working. There. Yeah, but they don't have any cinematographers. So you get to you know, and yeah, at that time they're like, uh, I mean, I don't know if this is still the case today. Maybe it is. Um, yeah, at least at that time they had, you know, they, those students tend to have like really good scripts. Uh, they had money, you know, so we like, you're shooting on 35. I had one, you know, those anamorphic in the desert of Utah, you know, just stuff that you, wasn't not happening, you know, um, elsewhere. So, and that was kind of my, that's when I really, really start building the craft as far as lighting. Cause I, w I didn't really execute. I mean, my lighting during my SVA time was pretty shit, you know, to be, to be frank, but I, yeah, that really developed after. Okay. Because lighting for me is one of the most difficult things. I mean, obviously I haven't worked on major things. I have worked with a couple of photographers a couple of years ago. I did a, um, did a collaboration with Canon. And one thing that surprised me, I mean, I didn't know what to expect to be honest going in, but it's how much emphasis there is on lighting, you know, me sort of going in naively as like a 16, 17 year old at the time thinking, okay, yeah, we set up the camera, great stuff. We've got this nice set that we built here. But then the lighting is like so much experimentation. I like the experimentation, but I was so blown away at how much emphasis there is on the lighting and how much, how how big of a difference it can make depending on where the light source is coming from. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people really don't think about the lighting when they see a movie, even though I'm, I, I'd like to ask you this, is lighting one of the most important things in cinematography? I mean, it's the only thing that's your own, you know? Yeah. Like uh, I, I tend to be very involved in, in um, shot design um, in most 
films that I do. Um, but, you know, no matter who you work for, like the lighting is that's that's, you know, if if the director's very involved, you know, that's that tends to be your your corner. Um, so, yeah, that's where you can really express yourself, you know, but it also it's like you don't even at least in my case, I didn't even see lighting until, you know, three years into trying to, you know, at film school, trying to be a filmmaker. So, yeah, and you and you don't really. You just it kind of arrives on its own, you know, you can't, I don't know, I couldn't, I guess you could sort of study it, you know, they teach you a three point lighting and all that, which it just, I don't know, was kind of dry, but uh, it's almost, a lot of it was just came at a almost accidental pace. You know, I remember just sort of figuring out bounce light, you know, one day it was just like doing, you know, and then everything I did for, you know, whatever, uh, for about half a year was, was bounce light, you know, and then you, you learn about, you know, uh, negative fill and then everything you know suddenly I was coding entire rooms in black except for what the camera saw because it was just like let's yeah. let's let's work this exercise you know uh, to completion so so um yeah then you learn about you know how to how to and then how to fill your fill light and where that should come from and how that you know it that the relationship of fill light to, to key light not only as in intensity but where should it come from and you know where should it, how do they work together in a in a you know to they they well it looks good and it you know looks believable um which not a, you know it's not a requirement for good cinematography at all but that's for me that's i like to believe it for some reason you know absolutely and i i was always thinking about this i've been thinking about this for years to be honest and you're the perfect person to ask this isn't a planned question but just speaking of lighting i always wondered let's say you're shooting a short film nothing major a couple thousand dollars is the budget that's about it it's like a college film or something and you film a scene one scene one day and the scene could either be underlit or overlit the dailies i mean which one is is a worse scenario if the if the dailies are underlit or overlit well it depends how you print it i guess you know uh i mean it depends on what the con content is i mean meaning it's accidentally under like underexposed or yes yes accidentally like they they planned it but something went wrong like and can it be fixed okay. in post-production oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, dailies they'll they'll print however they want, and you know you don't really ever know what you're looking at. Um, <laughs> so, but um, unless you do test at the beginning and say, "Well, just just print it like like this, please," and you know you got to strong arm some people sometimes. But uh, yeah, if it's film, uh, it's better to overexpose, and digitally, it's probably better to be slightly under of the two oh. of the two crimes, uh, or or you know, if you're shooting um, reversal film, then that's you want to underexpose rather than over, but in, in film negative, you know, color negative, you definitely more is generally better unless you're, you know, two stops plus off the mark. But either way, you're two stops off, and you know you're reshooting, whether it's up or down. Okay, perfect. And one thing that I really love about the um, the films that you've worked on, like I, I first saw The Lighthouse and I saw the the witch or the vivich. I never know how to pronounce it because <laughs> it's. it's yeah. Okay, it's the witch. That's fine. Um, so, one thing that I really found fascinating about the witch film project is that it was shot completely in natural lighting. If I have that correct, uh, well, I guess it depends on how you define that. I mean, I guess I don't think we. I mean, not at night. You know, we had HMIs, yeah. but uh, yeah, all the flame was was actual was actual flame. I think there's one there's one shot where. Um, the raven you couldn't have uh open flame and a raven on set so that's the one scene where we had a, right. a you know a flicker effect going on so uh yeah that all the flame was unsimulated um i mean i just took it like another tool yeah. um meaning that you know you don't just put candles around and shoot it it's uh you know you treat it like you would any other light source like where does it look best and how do you shape it and how do you you know how do you how do you how do you fill it, you know, um, which is also other flames, but they're not direct. They're probably, you know, have a card and then it's bouncing off another card and coming back. So, um, yeah, in the daytime, you just have nets and uh, for negative fill in, in our case. Um, 
Yeah, I don't think we, yeah, I don't burn any HMIs generally outside. So, okay. yeah. And for the exterior scenes that you were shooting on that film, did you, what would happen, let's say hypothetically, is that you you want to shoot the scene where Anya Taylor-Joy is playing with the baby and, you know, she does the boo and then the baby's gone. What would happen that day if hypothetically it just started raining? You know, would you schedule that for another day or would you wait for the rain to pass? Or maybe the sun wasn't in the right place. What would be the solution? Well, that that movie, we got lucky. I mean, it was only 27 days. Um, so... Yeah, we were in Ontario during that time of year, and you get a lot of cloudy days. So, um, and but if it was sunny, then we do an interior. So uh, that's that's one case we were constantly tying the schedule into you know knots because, you know, oh, it, it's suddenly sunny now we have to go inside. You know, and eventually you're gonna run out of interior scenes. You know, or we black out everything and completely and do a candlelit scene during the day inside. Um, uh, and there's a couple there's a couple day interior scenes where you 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 look carefully out the window. It's sunny out there. You know. Sure. Um, so, but that's one thing Rob won't, won't stand, especially now is like, he just won't take a, a sunny exterior, you know, no. so, which is interesting because our, our nights hard light, we always go for hard light at night and we always go for, um, soft light during the day, I guess in our movies, you know, it's cloudy during the day it suddenly clears up at night, but you know, that's what makes it look good. And that's what makes, um, passable moonlight in, in my opinion. So, um, but in the case of the baby anyway, that actually was a sunny day. And that took a while. Um, the shot of Anya, we shot um, one day, and uh, and it was cloudy behind her. And then you know the sun came out, and then uh, I had to build a tent around everything, you know. Yeah. So we shot that in like a probably a, a, tw a twenty by twenty cube, you know, diffusing the light. But then there's like a certain quality when it hits like you know grid cloth where it looks like sunlight hitting that thing. So you got to deaden it with nets and do you do it on the inside or the outside? And there's a lot of futzing around, especially then this is 10 years ago. I shot this 10 years ago this month, actually, um, wow. you know, where you have to, yeah. How do you make it feel like overcast, you know, um, for, for this baby? But <laughs> yeah, that little shot of the baby it was, was a bit of effort. Okay, fair uh, enough. I'll, I'll be sure to remember that next time I, I watch it. I'll probably watch it tonight now that you, now that you mentioned that that scene. And just curious, because I I don't know like why this is. What well, uh, genuinely? Why does Rob uh, Eggers not like to do sunny scenes? Is it just his style, or does he think it's not appropriate for his type of films? Uh, what is it about sunny exteriors? Yeah, I mean, both those things, you know. I mean, there's a few there's a few scenes in The Northman where he's like, all right, it's, I'm okay with it. But like, there's a scene where they're crossing Iceland and they have like front lit sunlight because that was the only direction at that location in Iceland where you could see the stuff that we came to the location to see, you know, yeah. um, and because of the the day schedule, we couldn't do it later in the day because then that would have been even a bigger sacrifice at another location we had to shoot that day. So, um, yeah, you just, you know, anyway, that scene where they're like crossing Iceland and they got chains on and it's like dusty, it, like it feels like a, you know, a biblical film from the 60s or something to him and it's just not his not his vibe you know it's like this is iceland this isn't a desert but um yeah that's not yeah i don't know that's uncommon um among some some filmmakers it's just not the it's not the mood, you know so we're trying yeah, to no, absolutely and, and i'm sure like the moods can make or break the scene right like i i don't think it would be appropriate if i know on alexander skarsgård like there was wonderful sort of Arabian Peninsula sun on him when he's in, you know, a Nordic island country. I don't, you know, that probably wouldn't work, I guess. What's is, Iceland? Is, is, it, was, it was a real location and, you know, it, the thermal steam going off in the background and everything. But yeah, it just doesn't, not the right, not the right mood. Um, and, you know, when we raid the village, we waited up to four hours for, you know, little bits of cloud to come in to make that. Because having that in the, in the direct sun, you know, was just a no good, just non-negotiable for him. And in regards to exterior light, well, actually, it can be interior too. I saw an interview with Leon Vitali where he often talked about how Stanley Kubrick wasn't really fond of lens flare. He liked it sometimes, but not all the time. Like, apparently when they were doing Eyes Wide Shut, he didn't mind, but apparently when they were doing stuff like Full Metal Jacket, he seemed to have a problem with it. As a cinematographer, what is your perspective on lens flare? Does it show a flaw? Because for me, I always wonder that it does sort of prove that the camera is there. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what they're, you know, uh, there are all kinds of flare, 
you know, uh, a modern lens will flare a certain way and you get like, or a zoom lens, especially you'll see, you know, 12 to 16, you know, pings going down the lens. And that's, uh, at least for my taste, quite distracting. Um, and then there's other more subtle kinds of flare, like, you know, um, you'll have ghosting, which is a little distracting. You have a bright window here and that's mirrored on the other part of the frame. Um, I, some of the lenses I like to use, uh, you know, the Baltars, for instance, um, from the, from about 1940, you know, they have a little bit of the ghosting. They don't have a lot of lens elements, the double gauss, you know, I think it's like six pieces of glass or something and only four surfaces. So, uh, if you, if you do well, also those were to get a flare, you usually need like a very hard pinpoint of light. So, but yeah. usually we have, we're in soft light, so things just kind of. Uh -huh bleed over the edges. And I find that, you know, at least on an Eggers movie, pleasantly appropriate, you know, you can't, it can't get too extreme. And then, you know, um, so I embrace certain kinds of flare, you know, uh, that's soft or you have a bright window, uh, inside, you know, it'll, it'll halate around the edges, but not too much. And it depends on which lens you get, you know, like Nosferatu, I was testing, you know, which different serial numbers of a Baltar, you know, and I had one that would flare too much for my taste at five stops over and there's one that's flaring at seven stops over well let's use the one that's you know i can go up seven stops over so i can i can uh take the window that bright if i want to for example absolutely yeah perfect and nosferatu i'm glad you mentioned it because i do have some questions on that later i just didn't know if there was some sort of nda where you couldn't talk, talk about, about it or something flare, you know fine but yeah yeah but yeah, yeah. perfect so just before that, because you, you brought up how you went to Iceland. Iceland has always been a country that I love to go to. I, I, I know a bit of the Icelandic language. I'm not fluent or anything, but I could probably ask for water. Yeah. I mean, I could survive. That's it. But, you know, it's sure. it's one of those things. Everyone but, knows English. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that is true. That is one benefit. Absolutely. Now, you, you've uh, you traveled to Iceland for the Northmen. You did uh, the witch in and the lighthouse in Canada. If I'm yes. correct, and a different parts. Traveled, of Canada, but yeah, those two, but yeah. sure, yeah, Eastern Canada and both. You places. traveled all over. I believe for Nosferatu, you did. Uh, you shot in Prague, in Romania. What has been your favorite country to work in as a cinematographer when you're going overseas? Oh, I mean, I would, I, I would like to shoot some stuff in the U.S. Uh, I don't tend to. Um, I mean, maybe the U.K. Maybe. Because, like, yeah. um, at least as far as, like, consistently great crew, you know, that was that was our experience. There was great, certainly great people in Prague, too. Um, but you kind of, there's a lot of television going on there, which kind of is a, a different craft than what we're after. But, but several great crew members there. So, you know, um, that's kind of like a... That's a that's a major thing having access to people who you know ha have uh, not just skill but passion you know yeah. uh, to sort of be an extension of of um, of your work you know so and then and it can bring can bring their own you know it's going to think of you know things that but yeah you get you I'm going into a different conversation now but yeah I personally I mean I recently told a producer like I just they're asking she's asking about gaffers I'm just like just give me the nerds just I want nerds you know not the um uh people yeah just people kind of want to build stuff and tinker and not just take the tool out of the box and use it like they use on every other film you know let's let's sort of let's play together you know yeah absolutely and if we take away the availability of a good crew and we talk about just sure location maybe a country where you thought had the best scenery which one would it be would oh, it be nice. iceland romania I I like to be a traveler, so for me it's it's really diversity, you know. Like, yeah. I like I first arrived in Prague. It's it's you know it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. It just is, you know. And then, but I, you know, after about six months, it's like, all right, we're making this film. I'm just distracted by the work or whatever. But you know, and by the end of it, it's like, all right, let's get out. Let's get out of Czech Republic, you know. So it's kind of like I, I love to do a western in yeah. Utah or something, you know, just because I haven't done that, you know, that would be, that would be fantastic. I would love to shoot something in Africa, you know, so it's sort of like, what's the next horizon is, is probably what's gonna, what's gonna guide me, you know, I mean, nothing. Yeah, you tend not to shoot in Japan, you know, like, I just wanna, I just wanna 
diversify my experience and and be caught off guard to a certain extent, you know, and, and do stuff I haven't done before. Yeah. Would you want to maybe shoot a, a film or any type of project in every continent, you know, so you do one in <laughs> in South America, in Africa, in Oceania, maybe on the the Solomon Islands or something, you know, these really small I chain of islands. Actually, I'd love to go to Solomon Islands. This is off topic, but yeah, I, I do have a an armchair list of places I want to go, and Solomon Islands is one of them. So, you know, I think I, I recently re rewatched uh, uh, Thin Red Line, you know, and uh, it was like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah that'd be great. Um, no, it's 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 a draw. It's not a reason to do a movie. It's it's kind of like, what's the movie that you could best serve and also is going to push you, you know, and, and, you know, is it, a, is it, who's the director and what's the script and who else is involved? Um, that's, that's, that's primary, but yeah, it's, it's a draw, you know, you have two films of similar, whatever, you know, it's, it's kind of the thing I haven't done before or the place I haven't, you know, um, explored on camera, you know, may or may not give it an edge for sure. So, yeah. Yeah, perfect. Because some of that that whole part of the world, the Pacific region, is some is a place where I'd really like to go to. I mean, they shot the Bounty and Mutiny on the Bounty sure. there. I can't imagine it looks the same now, but you know, I just really want to go oh. to Tahiti, Pitcairn's Island, just see what all that looks yeah. like now. Yeah, know? yeah. Uh, Marquesas, you know, yeah, I'd love. I want to go there before it's all underwater for sure. You know. Yeah. Now there has there's always been quite a large debate I found in the cinematographer community if you will I, I don't know how to describe right. it or the filmmaking space you, you, you might know like a, yeah <laughs> yeah about. like a grand one about you know some people like quentin tarantino are on one side some people like george lucas are on the other in your case do you which one do you think is better digital or celluloid uh i mean i i I from I think you know the answer. I mean, it's yeah, it's um, I think for my tastes, I, I strongly prefer the the film palette, you know. So for me, it's not really about having grain or any of that. It's just it's just a nicer palette. It's just a nicer image to look at, you know. Um, so people, yeah, there's like people who shoot it to for its flaws, and you know. But I'm someone who. Um, I don't know. I, I wonder if Nolan feels this way or it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a better palette. I don't want it to look grunge. I don't want to shoot because it has grain or, you know, whatever bleeding around the highlights, red edges on things. It's it's just because I just look at it and uh, it's just a breath of fresh air, you know. Um, doesn't mean I would never, you know, I have shot digitally and I, you know, um, I haven't done a film digitally in a, in a little bit, but, you know, commercials and so on. Um, yeah, it's just my, just my preference, you know. And, and is there any deeper preference, you know, is, would you prefer to do a 35 millimeter, uh, 70 millimeter IMAX, you know, is there any type in, in particular that would, you'd love to work with? I mean, of course, yeah, large, I mean, I, I shoot large format film for myself, you know, in, in still oh. photography. So yeah, it's, that's kind of the best of both where you just have all that micro detail and micro contrast and you still have the palette. Uh, of film, so yeah, I'd love to do that uh, in, in motion picture if I were ever ever allowed. Um, of course, you know. So yes, I, again, I, I certainly have no grain fetish. It's just to have that palette and have that depth, you know, um, of detail. Well, yeah, that'd be ideal. And as your experience, I, I will say, I feel like you specifically as a cinematographer, you are, as you like to say, quite diversified in the sense that you do something like The Northman, which is in colour, to put it simply, and you do something like The Lighthouse, which is in black and white. Now, one thing that I was always, always fascinated by, ever since, like I said, I saw Great Expectations, what are the differences between shooting in black and white and in colour? Uh, as far as what, like what you do? Um... Well, it's like it's kind of a craft that's not really uh, we don't get to develop, um, to be honest. So uh, and I think that there is a lot of when you do have black and white cinematography these days, it's. Um, in my in my view, you know, betrays uh, the fact that it was shot by someone sort of trained in, in color and in that um, it's sort of a it tends to be a flatter image, just sort of desaturated you know um and even for me i yeah i tend to shoot um 
I think a, a pastel scene. Uh, I don't know, color to me kind of looks better pastel on black and white. I went, I went a little harder and edgier, you know, so yeah. like, uh, black and white at, um, you know, sunnier day, a sunny day is probably better for that than, than in color, you know, for, I don't know, whatever reason, it's just like, just re trying to re maintain the same amount of, um, detail, you know, or it's like, or the same amount of information, uh, because, you know, color, you have all this color information. So I, I my tendency is to sort of simplify other aspects, the contrast, um, or, or the, you know, um, yeah, the contrast and a black and white, it, it just kind of becomes the, it is just sort of soft, you know, um, in the lighthouse, it's a little hard because obviously you have all those overcast days, you know, I was pushing it a stop, um, rather developing anyway, it's all relative, but you know, developing normal on the interiors, I pull a little bit. So it gave more, a little more contrast to the exteriors just to give it a little extra tooth. And, you know, they're a little grainier if you look at them closer, uh, more closely. Um, yeah, and yeah, harder light, um, probably go emptier shadows, you know, more highlights, uh, color, it can just get busy quickly uh, with contrast and color, you know, and even color, I tend to encourage uh, the team to, you know, use less colors in the in the wardrobe and the and the, and the production design, which on a Rob movie is, you know, they're doing anyway, so it's it's easy. Yeah, I can't imagine that there'd be like a massive neon style project anytime soon. Or maybe there is, maybe my expectation will be subverted, but I can't imagine that uh, Robert Eggers would do sort of like a neon picture from, I don't know, maybe 1700s Spain where everything's in extreme colors, sure. sort of like the 2001 Space Odyssey Stargate. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'd be curious to see uh, if he ever did a sci-fi what that would look like, you know? I don't know, I don't know. And I I was watching the documentary on on the lighthouse. I, I'll be honest, I watched this years ago because I was so in, I so interested in that style of filmmaking. Uh, what is the difference between monochromatic and orthochromatic or orthochromatic? Oh, it's just the um, it's the spectrum of colors that you then tran you, know, you uh, translate into black and white. I mean, orthochromatic is monochromatic. Monochromatic is just a general term. You know, there's okay. the result only has one one color, but what, what wavelengths, what colors are you using to turn black and white? So are you including red, green, blue? Are you including infrared? Are you including ultraviolet? So, um, yeah, you actually have a lot of, and they all look different in black and white yeah. too, you know? Um, I'm told that James Wong Howe, which, you know, shoot moonlit scenes his, in his black and white films, you know, moonlit scenes uh, ortho, in or, on orthochromatic film and then the day scenes on, you know, panchromatic film. You know, so um, just so the skin, you know, you just sort of feel that you feel the blueness, even in black and white, you know, by how the skin is rendered. And and was it the choice to shoot orthochromatic, the lighthouse in orthochromatic? Because I, if I remember correctly, you and Rob said that it was to sort of make the imperfections more clear in in Rob and Willem's characters. So maybe yeah. the pores would be more visible. Yeah, it. Um... Yep, that's that's a big that's a big part of it. But yeah, it's really just um, to evoke early photography. Um, I mean, really, when the lighthouse took place, you know, uh, I think you're probably no, you had orthochromatic film at that time. Um, yeah. But yeah, it would have been a little more than blue sensitive, you know. You, so yeah, you would have been exposing ultraviolet blue and 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 green. Um, yeah, it's just to uh, evoke the look of that stuff, which just had a lot more uh, texture. Your lips were dark, your skies were bright. Um, yeah. Any little blood vessels in your face are, you know, really more in your face. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where it began. And also just that extra micro contrast, you know, as a way to um, just build contrast in black and white, like I was talking about just to, um, which you can do with a red filter too. It's like whenever you narrow the spectrum, it starts looking further from, what your eyes see, you know, if you use a red filter, that's, you know, that's generally what, what's used to build contrast actually, like on a paper moon or something, you know, it's like clearly everything's on a red filter because it's the opposite of what we did, right? So it's the other end of the spectrum while you're, all your um, Caucasian skin tones are alabaster and your skies are quite bright, you know, or, or dark rather. So um, yeah, we just, we just flipped it. But that to me looks very modern or at least very 
mid late you know uh mid 20 or late 20th century you know as far as what what photographers are doing that's a very it's a little bit of a ansel adams look to me you know and in regards to aspect ratios uh, you suggested uh, to shoot the lighthouse in one nineteen to one. Sure. How do you make that decision of okay, we're gonna? I think we should do this film in one nineteen to one, or fourteen three, or one six, or four three, or one sixty six to one. Is it the style that the director is looking for, or do you experiment? Uh, no, it was it was it was always. I mean, from the the beginning, it was conceived as four by three. I mean, he had the idea around for a long time, and I think you know he knew the aspect ratio before he. Had a story actually because that's kind of how he thinks so it's like atmosphere I was like, well okay a big part of the atmosphere is like it need to be boxed in all right that was i mean that that was probably the conceit since before the witch even was made you know so um and i was just you know i, I like to push ideas to their like terminus you know all right and then you know so once I, once i learned about movies in the early sound period being at 119 i just would float it you know like well, i don't know what about this aspect ratio so um that's even further you know and it, i was comfortable with it because you know i own a Hasselblad and that's how i shoot portraits anyway so you know or i mean it's square not 119 but it's yeah pretty much pretty close so uh i was comfortable with it and you know i feel like sometimes as a cinematographer i can be a little crazier because you still have the filter of the director to say yes or no so and you know in this in this case he he went for it so which kind of encourages me to come up with even, you know, crazier ideas uh, as we go through the, through the films. Perfect. And is it when you're framing a scene with with the with the cameras, is it harder to frame a scene if you're shooting in something like 119 to 1 or if you were shooting 16 by 9 because the frame is tighter? So I'd imagine you'd have to sort of squeeze in a bit more, put the important background props closer to the actors uh yeah or or give more interest further up or maybe you're just dealing more in close-ups generally you know um so yeah that movie became more of a close-up movie um i mean for me that actually the trickiest aspect ratio is 185 you know because it's sort of like here nor there um so um yeah i'm just kind of it's for me it's just a it's a lovely portrait shape um you know where you get a nice rate because people are vertical objects, you know, and, and it's just a nice, uh, you, st you still have plenty of space on the sides. You just do one at a time instead of two at a time, you know, so it's it's a nice like single person um, ratio, uh, where it's a nice balance between environment and, you know, it's a good environmental portrait. You know, it's a great balance between environment and person. So um, I'd love to do it again, you know, or at least four by three, you know, so um, scope I like too, you know, that's more of a, a one dimensional, um, uh, composition, which you know is kind of interesting too, but yeah, one eight five. I just don't know what to to do with that. Sometimes, I mean, I, you know, you can figure it out, but but it's kind of like it's a kind of a vague decision, you know. Personally, I don't know if this aspect ratio is still used, but for me, I'm quite a fan of older films, so I really like one sixty six to one. I feel like it's 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 there so it's noticeable but it's not extremely noticeable you know like sometimes i feel like the frame can be too tight but 166 i feel like like you said with 185 is a nice balance for me 166 is there i like it, i appreciate it, but also it doesn't take away i mean i think i can reveal this but not brought to you is 166 you know it's just a nice it's just a classy aspect ratio it doesn't really yeah it doesn't scream like this is a movie you know you can sort of relate it to other forms of two-dimensional art in my you know opinion or at least i feel that way so um yeah it's a it's a you can't really compositions can be a little conservative or at least how i do them um perhaps but um it's a very yeah it's a very cozy aspect ratio and then what, what oh, so it's in, like i don't know um here nor there and kind of it's a little awkward I uh, certainly, I uh, certainly definitely appreciate that Nosferatu will be 166 to 1. And actually, I do have some questions on Nosferatu, if you if you don't mind. I don't know how much you can reveal because it hasn't come out yet. But when you were working on shooting Nosferatu in, in pre-production, did you source the 1922 film Nosferatu or, or did Rob say, hey, we're going for a different style? Or did you look at it for inspiration? I mean, the movie has been in the works for so freaking long that, you know, 
yeah, of course I watched it, but I watched it like 2016, you know? Okay. So, and, and I watched it a few times and, you know, um, our, our movie doesn't, we're not trying to make it look like that at all. So it's really just, let's just, um, I mean, it's just part of who Rob is. Like he doesn't have to watch it, you know, really at this point, like he'll, he'll show people, you know, like, Oh, are we going to have, you know, Orlock rise like they did in this movie or not, or, you know, sort of decisions like that. But, but really the, yeah, his, his Nosferatu is just its own, it's its own thing. You know, I think that's the only way to, to go, um, not try to emulate the earlier, earlier, earlier film. And was there heavy I mean, research I done? No. And, and yeah, of course. yeah. And was there heavy research done again in prep for Nosferatu like there was for the lighthouse and the witch? You know where they take a look at the clothing, the the way people spoke back yeah. then. Was, was it a similar process? Absolutely. Yeah, same stuff. You know, so I learned a lot about you know that. Uh, I mean, it's Germany, but you know the the Victorian age. Uh, yeah. So yeah, some surprises in there, but I can't go into that yet. But um, yeah, same stuff. Mm. And just staying on the topic of pre-production, mm -hmm. when doing research, I often see people have different styles, like um, Stanley Kubrick was famous and well-known. I've heard many people who work with him tell me personally as well that he just liked to walk around the set and find the quote-unquote perfect shot. Steven Spielberg allegedly likes to plan out every single shot in his film in his future films before they even start production. What is your process like as a cinematographer? Do you sketch out shot ideas or do you experiment? Uh, yeah, we, we draw everything. So um, yeah, Rob and I'll talk it through. Um, he's He's got to deal with all aspects of making the film. So uh, I get on a film with him quite early now. Um, I mean, we shot in February in Osprey I was there in end of August. You know, we started storyboarding things. Um, so um at some point we're trying to find locations to match the storyboards you know but i at least i don't know how rob feels but um i mean the the ultimate would would be to to be stanley kubrick and and um just have that much time on his set but he had shooting schedules that no one else is going to get you know so storyboards is some some grasp at being fully prepared when you go to set up the camera you know and if you can't have you know, movie stars, uh, they're months in advance, then, you know, you got to sort of do your best, you know. Um, so, what, I mean, one thing we do that is, um, that I enjoy very much, that Craig Production Designer may enjoy a little less is, um, I don't know, he might like it. Um, just that, you know, there's like, when you storyboard, there's a, there's a back and forth, but, you know, it's like, well, this set is, uh, here's the accurate version. This is what I think it would be. This is what feels right. And then, you know, we'll go into it uh, from, you know, a camera perspective and like, how do you shoot this space uh, in a way that we want to present it, you know, and, and how do we, you know, do we want to move the, the camera through this space uh, in one shot or whatever, or, or be able to pan left and see this thing or what's, what's the great, you know, what's, what's the ideal uh, punctuation, you know, um, as far as the shots and, and the editing. Um, and that may or may not be compatible with what's what's accurate because you know on 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 his films uh, the accuracy is is very important you know so um, yeah where would the staircase be where would the you know where would the columns be where would the you know how are hallways built can we put a door there it'd be great if I could pan you know only this much and see a door a doorway here and reveal this but you know Craig may say well there'd never be a door there you know think about it like what what's what's behind that door um anyway you can make arguments like in the shining like well the, none of the space makes any sense but um i think it i think for their mind just like i like to believe the lighting you know they rob and craig want to believe that you are actually in this time period and, and in that you know uh, house or castle or whatever it is so you know that that's always sort of the, the back and forth so i try to be as respectful as i can and but i i will sort of needle like well you know this would be the imagine this is is, is the the camera could express this, you know, visually, and and we try to find something where everyone's happy. And how so, much? And you only have that if you have six months of. You only you only have that if you have six months of of prep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And go through the entire movie. Yeah. 
So yeah. Sorry. And how much of that changes? How much of that changes in the actual production? Or let's say you sketch out a scene. Are the shots identical to the storyboards, or or does it change when you're actually shooting? Or do no, you stick very loyal to the storyboards? Doesn't 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 change. I mean, I think they're you know, I mean, there's like I think there's a scene on a location, you know, uh, in the last movie where um, it did change. And, you know, to this day, it bothers me because we didn't, you know, uh, we didn't like plan it properly. So then we're we're not used to like scrambling on set, you know, so that. Yeah, there's just, but uh, everything else is pretty much as it was uh, designed. Yeah. So. And it's also because we build everything, you know, so. Yeah. Or we're, you know, we're visiting the location for for months and we know it intimately or it's just, or to build on the location, you know. Yeah. So, and it's and it's close by and oh you know i didn't figure out this this scene here so let's let's take a trip to such and such place and we'll walk around it for three hours until it's dark and then whatever yeah and it is in regards to the actual location like you said how when you're uh, storyboarding with rob you also after after you finish storyboarding maybe finish storyboarding the sequence you go okay let's try and actually find some locations is that extremely is the location extremely important for it to match what you drew or can that be i don't know negotiated in a way where let's say it's not exactly what you drew but it it's also something that you hadn't thought about yeah it's either exactly what we drew or it's like look we're just not finding this yeah this country and trust me we'll we will drive all over the place until you're it's just like you know we're just not finding it you know four months later uh, all right, so let's let's reconceive this. But it's never like on set. It's you know it's at least it's at least a month away. You know, yeah. so yeah. And and how do you how do you know, for example, where you are going to shoot? Apart from obviously the sketching, like how did you know that for the lighthouse you'd want to do that in Canada? Was that also because of the the images that you drew or was that just uh, more of a technical convenience? Oh, that's, that's just, I mean, that's just, you know, following the money, you know? <laughs> so like where, where is the, where is, uh, where are their tax breaks, you know, which is kind of the, the game everyone's playing, you know, that's, that's why I shoot so much in Atlanta, you know, uh, terrible light be damned. But, um, but um, yeah, but, Every every place has worked out on you know in Rob's case it it needs to look like Maine and thankfully it's right next door uh, in the yeah. case of Lighthouse so it's uh, in Ontario you know he, he's going to be specific about you know the kind of pines that are there and obviously the age and whether they branch low or not so um, you know luckily he found that there. You know, and we'll, I'm, we'll, I'm very happy that you brought up tax breaks because on the last episode I spoke about that heavily with my previous guest Tom. It, shooting in Europe, obviously, I was in I was in Europe. Re- well, I was kind of am in Europe, but I was in mainland Europe recently. I was actually in Prague, Czech Republic, and places like Budapest, Berlin, places like that. And they're quite known in my in my experience and opinion for being sort of cheaper locations. For example, a film like Munich, I believe they shot some scenes that were set in Paris in Budapest because Hungary is a cheaper location to to shoot, and I imagine has lower has a better tax break than France would. Our tax breaks, like you said, there. everything. You know what I mean? They're gonna have Art Nouveau there, and yeah, maybe you can you can do that. Sure. Yeah. 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 Not a lot of American. Sorry about all those street noise. Uh, yeah, there are not a lot of American films shooting in in France. I'd love to shoot in France, but it seems like a, a little bit of a closed system. I did a music video there, but getting off point. Um, yeah, I mean, at least in our case, um, on a you know on a Rob film he's he's building all the sets so um, you know labor costs are you know maybe paramount you know as far as being able to shoot somewhere you know like he would love to shoot that he lives in London now you know I do too but you know it'd be great to shoot in the UK but you know the labor costs of uh, building every single set is you know prohibitive. Yeah, I'd imagine that, and I imagine that is why many people go to places like Budapest or. Right. Uh, your places where it's it's a little bit cheap and there probably is a better tax break. Hungary has a reputation of being quite a low country, any anyway, low tax country anyway. I mean, right. especially for businesses and things like that, they don't have the best policy in my opinion in the world, but they certainly have a pretty good incentive. And um, just going back to this whole pre-production 
uh, thing in regards to storyboarding and sketching. Now, you also mentioned that you do photography. Is the process different in the pre-production between photography, still photography, and, uh, and film photography, like when you're working on a film, or is it very similar? Yeah, I mean, you can't really compare them, really, because, you know, still photography, I'm, yeah, it's, uh, I'm reacting to stuff, you know, and that's just what I, what, you know, what I can do when I, between films and I'm traveling through the Southwest US or wherever, you know, I mean, I took a rather large camera to Iceland just because you have to, you know, when you have an opportunity like that. So I have a 12 by 20 inch camera I took to Iceland <laughs> and that's like three cases was a little bit ridiculous, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the most you'll do in still photography is, uh, you know, you see something and you know that the light's going to be better, you know, another time, you know, oh, this, I can see what this might be uh, when the sun is three quarter back instead of three quarter front, I got to come back on a sunny day, you know, at this time. And sometimes you're able to get there and sometimes you're not, you know, so, but yeah, still photography, still photography is just something I can do on my own. You know, there's great things about collaboration and then there's stuff where you just want to, you know, be a dictator. So that's is it sort of like a hobby for you uh so far yeah yeah we'll see i'm trying to build a portfolio but um i have 30 years of negatives i have to wade through so i mean probably 20 years of good ones the first 10 are coming out of high school so we'll see but yeah just just uh, i just bought a scanner and i'm trying to figure out just trying to see what i have you know yeah. so and, and as we as we wrap, I'd just like to go on. We've talked a lot about pre-production, but now one thing that I always ask my guests is not even the post-production, but beyond that. Let's say you're at the premiere for the for the Lighthouse, the Witch, the Northman, or in the future, Nosferatu. What is your first reaction to the films when you finish watching them at the premiere and you walk out of the theater? Do you see yourself there because you, you remember those days or do you see it as a completely different picture? Uh, depends how much time has passed. You know, like I've been grading this movie uh, for months, you know, and the, the funny thing is I've never properly seen it. I've watched it in like just excruciating detail, you know, is that like to an eighth of a color point or, you know, we could take down this little, you know, whatever this this shadow on the wall. If I just take that down, you know, it'll give the shot extra depth, whatever. And um, but I've never never heard the score. I've never, I mean, maybe here and there we'll, you know, we'll watch with music to see if it, whatever, a, a scare works, you know, because uh, the sound is such a big part of that too, in addition to the image, you know, um, but but 99% of it I actually haven't watched as a film. So I'm kind of excited to, to see it, you know, just to see, because I'm just picking it apart, you know, on a, yeah. just visuals only. So, um yeah, it'll be, it'll be, and, and also because it's coming out in December, it's going to be quite fresh, you know, so it'll be 10 months since working on it. So um, uh, in a way, I kind of have to wait like everyone else, even though I've, I've watched it over and over and over. So. And wait, is there any film in particular that you worked on, maybe music video, like you said, or anything where you finish that project, you finish shooting that project, and you feel like you learn the most during that process. Is there any one in particular where you feel like you you learn the most? Uh, yeah, the Northman. That was like the biggest yeah. biggest lesson. You know that yeah, that was um, sort of picking up the lighthouse because I hadn't shot film in a while. You know because the Alexa had been out for eight years at that point, and then I kind of took over everything. And now I haven't really shot a movie, movie digitally since you know the lighthouse. But anyway, yeah, just sort of. Uh, as far as my learning curve, it was just sort of ramped up from there. Um, and the Northman was, you know, leaps and bounds. And not as far as sort of at, at the tail end of it, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to remain um, uncomfortable enough, you know, you don't yeah. want to be too comfortable and, and kind of do the same thing over and over, uh, even though you're sort of working within the same director and the same, you know, uh, dark thing you know how to how to diversify and how to how to challenge yourself that yeah the right now the challenge is how to how to still grow you know i'll never grow as much as i did during the northman you know that'll never happen but um how to keep that there otherwise it's kind of like what's the what's the point you know and what was the what was the learning curves that you learned on the northman what was it about the northman that perhaps was missing with the lighthouse or the witch or mm -hmm. any previous projects you'd worked on well, it's, it's, uh, I mean, I'm probably gonna say some obvious stuff, you know, it, obviously working at that sort of scale, um, uh, has all kinds of 
ramifications. I mean, we had an excellent crew because, you know, there was, uh, there was a budget, you know, um, so maybe, you know, I'm sure it has a small part to do with my affection for UK crews, but, um, cause we had like the best, we really did. Um, but, uh, yeah, like a, this, this, the scale of the night exteriors in that movie, you know, um, were just massive, you know, so, um, and actually shooting, shooting them at night and not, cause we couldn't really fall back on day for night because it's cloudy there all the time. I personally don't feel that soft light works at all for, um, for night scenes, you know, that are, um, at least they're supposedly lit by the moon, um, to lay and bend to light that will sort of overpower, you know, um, overcast light by uh, by two stops but um yeah it, it's sort of that it was also the the mise-en-scene we really pushed ourselves to you know once he said you know, we're trying to have long shots with uh, all kinds of sh stuff going on um you know that the longer take stuff and that became a, a project you know how to really distill everything down to you know these sort of long visual ri you know uh, ribbons basically um a little bit of political stuff, um, but that was more freeing uh, in my case than I'm sure Rob was hit more of the political bits, you know, um, dealing with two studios and and all that. So he probably relatively had a lot less of that, you know, in that regard. But And on the Northmen, just sticking on that as we wrap up, what would you say was the most difficult scene or sequence to shoot for the Northmen? Um... I mean, the night exterior stuff was a technical pain in the ass for for sure. Um, especially the first few we did, you know, trying to figure out like what's the, what's the process. You don't really have a template yet for how to light stuff. I know I wanted, you know, the hard light at, at minus two stops, and I wanted the the fill light at minus four, and getting that uniformly over a huge area, you know, within a third of a stop, um, you know, is uh, tedious, you know. So um, yeah, and also the winds there were so high, so we'd have, you know, we had to put the the bounce frames for the fill light, you know, on on construction machines and not, you know, they had to be on Manitou's. They couldn't be on like a like a, a, a basket, you know, lift. Um, how to best use the ridges that were naturally there as lighting positions, you know, to light the vast area because you're not just going to have it on a lift, you know, and it, um, yeah, it was a huge learning curve and also just figuring out like what do you believe for night what are the lighting ratios and um yeah try to make night that where where you believe it um yeah anyway the the the, the yeah the, the frames on machines also had to have like we had to make them custom and put like holes in them so the wind could blow through them you know because the the winds are so intense in, in ireland yeah and because I always imagined that it would have been quite difficult to shoot the the ending fight scene between Amleth and, and Fjolnir, if I if I have his name right, you know, oh. by the volcano. I imagine was that a difficult scene to shoot, or was that quite easy? Um, yeah, nothing was easy. The whole movie, you know, was a wonderful pain in the ass. Um, but that scene was not as bad as some other stuff, like the Warrior King underground, as from a lighting perspective, was was. Uh, even more difficult, you know, so, um, yeah, you really had to get the lighting ratio just right, you know, to, I mean, obviously it's much too bright to be a cave underground, not lit by torches, you know, like it's total bullshit, but you sort of, you know, it just passes in a movie, you know, for me anyway. Yeah, perfect. And now we have it. Jaron, it's been an absolutely amazing podcast. Yeah. I've learned so much from you. I thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to have you back on any time. It was sure. really, really great. And yeah, yeah. his uh, portfolio website will be all in down below in the description. I'm sure you'll know who he is. But if you want to check out some of his other work, maybe some music videos he's done, like he said in France, then be sure to check them out. They'll be linked in the description.